In his book, The Big Sort, journalist Bill Bishop talks about a trend in American society in which for the last decade, we are living in more and more homogeneous communities, culturally, geographically, politically, economically. And the result of that is that we see difference and divergence less and less. And this is not only true in according to the people that we encounter every day in the grocery store or the post office, but it's also true of the people that we encounter and the ideas that we encounter online because of search engines like Google or social networking sites like Facebook, we are sorted. We come across information according to the patterns of our previous online experience. So I want to tell you about two examples for me of how the big sort came to affect me in a big way. Over the summer, as many of us did, I watched the congressional debates around the raising of the debt ceiling with increasing dismay as I watched the political reality overcome the economic hardship and the reality of people really losing their jobs and our standing for our country abroad. And I saw that what our leaders were concerned about was the sordid few who shared their political views and who would donate to their campaigns and reelect them, rather than the actual reality of the common good and what was really moving us. More personally, this fall, I attended a forum, and I met Sam, a returning war veteran from Iraq. And he told about his story and his experience of the war. And what I expected to hear was a story about overcoming loss and challenges of finding a job and getting an education, perhaps physical wounds or psychological wounds. But instead, what I heard was that his biggest challenge was the isolation he felt from all of us from fellow Americans. And I realized that Sam and I had been sorted, except for this experience of going to this forum, I would never have encountered him, because I'm in a different socioeconomic class, and I don't really know anybody who went to fight in Iraq. How different that was from my experience of the Vietnam War growing up, where there was a draft, and it affected almost everyone. And even if it didn't, we saw images every night on the news, and we heard and saw body counts every day in the newspaper that we all commonly read. But now we're sorted, and it's different. I think it's very unhealthy for us to be so distanced from this pain and accountability for a war that we're prosecuting. I think it's un-American not to have to account to each other for our political decisions to all of us. I think that the big sort dims our emotional intelligence and our capacity for compassionate action. I think it's one of the biggest civic challenges that we face in America today. So I want you to come with me and to imagine a different cultural shift to reinvigorate America's big tent. The idea of a big tent is not new. It was used politically in the 19th century to great effect by the Republican Party, and then in the 20th century in the era of FDR by the Democrat, Democratic Party to gather people together surely with different agendas, but who would compromise to have collective impact and get something done. But I don't really want to talk today about the political implications of the big tent as much as the cultural implications, and for me, the Big Tent is best represented by the Wisconsin State Fair. I used to live in Milwaukee, and the fair was my favorite time of year. I loved the 4-H demonstrations by teens showing their animals that they had raised. I loved the blueberry pie baking contests and the halls and halls of animals, pigs and chickens and rabbits, every breed, every color, every size and shape and form. I love the big rock concerts, and I love the small ethnic music demonstrations. I love the inventors and their gizmos and gadgets. To me, with the Wisconsin State Fair was America strutting her stuff in the most bold way and colorful way. And it really made me feel a, a part of Wisconsin, even though I only lived there for a year. America's Big Tent shelters the we of we the people. America's Big Tent welcomes strangers and understands that we, as a nation of immigrants, have our strength from the cultural richness that diverse people bring and from the economic wealth that they bring. 
and from the hope that they bring for new possibilities. So how do we do this? The big sword is very powerful. It affects our media. It affects uh, so much of we, what we encounter every day. So how do we bring the big tent into our lives? I want to give you six suggestions. They're very personal, everyday suggestions of what you can do. They help me. So the first is to find allies. This is not work that you can or should do alone. I'm lucky enough to work for an organization called City Club, which is a civic organization that welcomes people of diverse political background and generation and professional background to come and talk about public policy. And I'm inspired every day by people building community together with very different perspectives. So find allies. Secondly, cultivate appreciation. Whether it's the words of the founders like we the people or in order to form a more perfect union and establish justice, or I have a dream. If those words make you feel patriotic, use them as a mantra or a prayer every day. And maybe it's not words at all. Maybe it's a place like a national park or the Lincoln Memorial. And if it is, go there to cultivate your appreciation. Third, remember a crisis like a flood or in this region, an earthquake and the outpouring of generosity and compassion and caring from neighbor to neighbor, whether it's in a local community or around the world. That outpouring of generosity is a characteristic American trait. Be proud of it and remember it. Be curious. When the world sorts information and media for you, go out and find diverse sources of information, whether it's people or other news sources. Remember that judgment comes at the end of deliberation, not the beginning, and that you'll be smarter and wiser when people challenge your idea. So be curious. Next, participate in civic rituals, whether it's the Wisconsin State Fair or Bumbershoot or a block party down the street. Go to places where you can feel connected to neighbors, where you can feel a sense of belonging. And better yet, volunteer at those places, and you'll see that that sense of belonging and connectedness to each other spikes. And finally, search for the yeses. When the world is sorting us out into political zones and economic zones, you be the one who finds and articulates common ground. So these are six suggestions that I use to secure myself, to anchor uh, the big tent in my life personally. But I also want to tell you about and invite your participation for a communal big tent activity that's going to happen next year. It's in connection to the 50th anniversary of Seattle's World's Fair in 1962, the biggest big tent event that ever happened here. And it's physically at Seattle Center, the legacy, uh, our physical big tent here in Seattle. And it's being planned by a group of organizations and individuals. It's called the Next 50 Debate. We'll focus on the gubernatorial race next year, and our goal is to reverse the polarities of the big sword, not to make it a spectator sport with winners and losers, but instead to foster deliberation and conversation among citizens and between citizens and candidates that's about our shared future and priorities. If you'd like to get involved, we'd love to have your voice. You can contact me at City Club and we'd really welcome your participation. But even if that's not something that inspires you, I hope these other suggestions will, because it's important. Your voice is important. We need to shift our culture. So I urge you to stake the big tent in your heart. Let it influence the people you encounter, the experiences you have. And most of all, let it expand the space that you create for others. Thanks.